Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. If you are new here and enjoying what you are hearing or you have been here and haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help this video be pushed into the algorithm and the channel, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Road Trip Horror Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. This happened about an hour ago. My friend and I were coming back to my town after hanging out across the state line, when this lady starts flashing her brights to make my friend go faster. We were going the speed limit, and it was dark and very hard to see. After a while, she pulls to the side of us, which she could have done the whole time, and we can hear her yelling at us like a banshee through our rolled up windows. In our state, several people have been shot over road rage, so my friend grabs for her phone in case something starts going down. As she is reaching, the car swerves slightly toward the lady, and she recovers. The lady screams even louder and gets behind us again, riding our bumper. We come to the first exit for the town I live in, and I told my friend to take it so we could not have this crazy lady on our bumper. She ends up following us to the exit, so I have my friend turned into a parking lot. The lady followed us but got caught by a red light. We go to leave the parking lot, back to the highway, and she is coming back up on us again. Luckily, a truck pulled out and blocked her vision of us, and we made a right turn when the traffic allowed on a red light and swerved between cars to put as much distance between us as possible. We finally lost her after she had been on our tail for over 11 miles. Crazy stalker lady, I hope we don't ever see you again. Oh, and also, if she had not been lost at that last turn, I had the police's phone number queued up on my phone, ready to call. I'm not sure if this is actually really creepy or if I'm just super bothered by semi-trucks in general, but here's my story. This happened back in March. My sister and I were heading to an airport for our 6 a.m. flight to Orlando, Florida to get to Universal Studios. So this incident happened between 3 to 3.30 a.m. We're driving along the interstate when we come up behind a semi-truck. The semi is keeping up with traffic, so my sister decides to not pass him. Knowing that I really hate being next to big trucks because I am deathly afraid of them. My family has had a few close calls with them, and I've personally known people who've lost loved ones in horrific accidents, including the trucks. For a while, being behind the truck was fine. Like I said, it was keeping up with the flow of traffic and being fine. But then, about 20 minutes in, the driver starts doing a few bizarre things. The truck will start to brake, or it starts to swerve into the next lane. There is literally nothing in front of the truck, nor is it stormy. It was a cloudy night, but not windy. We weren't following the truck very close, but after that, my sister backs off even more. Soon enough, we are away from the rest of the traffic and it's just us and the truck. It's still randomly hitting the brakes when it suddenly swerves off the lane and hits the rubble stripes. I'm finally like, would you please pass this truck? He's being really weird. My sister agrees with me and starts gaining speed to just get around the truck very quickly. As she signals and switches lanes, the truck speeds up a little. My sister doesn't let that deter her and just hits the gas. When we got up next to the cab of the truck, 
the driver lays on his horn, starts flashing his high beams, and speeds up even more, and starts to swerve over into our lane. My sister floors it and manages to pull her car in front, though we were forced onto the rubble stripes to avoid being sideswiped by this truck. She keeps going fast, and when we get a good distance in front of the truck, she gets back over and starts to slow down a bit. But then, she's just like, Seriously? What the fuck is this truck's problem? I look in the side mirror, and this truck is just hauling ass, like he's trying to catch up to us. My sister speeds up again and is pushing past 85 miles per hour when we're able to start pulling away from this truck. The speed limit was 65 for trucks and 70 for cars, by the way. We eventually catch up to the traffic that had left us behind with the truck. From there, we were able to slow down a little more, but with that truck gaining on us again, we passed through them, and when the truck caught up with the traffic, he slowed way down, and we were able to lose them. I told this story to a few people, and they're always like, oh, that just sounds like road rage. But I honestly don't know what my sister and I did to piss this guy off, if that's the case. But I do know that this trucker made my paranoia around semi-trucks even worse. So this happened about four years ago when I was around 27 or 28. At the time, I worked in a job that was about 45 minutes away from... No, oh, shit. At the time, I worked in a job that was about 45 minutes worth of a drive on a good day. It was a drive along little country roads to get to this isolated country town, but the pay was good and the benefits worked for me. Each night on my way home, I would drive down the main street of the town to an intersection, turning right to head towards home. This one night, I drove down to this intersection and waited for the lights to turn. Suddenly, I hear this rap on my passenger window. I turn and see these two men staring at me through the window of their car. Both kind of scruffy, the driver looking really angry. Wondering what's going on, I lowered my window. The driver didn't even let me talk. Why'd you cut me off back there? I was confused, having not seen another car when I pulled out. Um, I didn't? He looked at me even angrier at my denial. Yes, you did. Back on, redacted. We nearly crashed. I didn't come down, redacted. I was in the parking area at the top of the street and turned from another road. It must have been someone with a similar car. My car's a distinctive color, but I've seen a lot of other cars like it. You fucking liar. I don't believe you. He was getting louder and redder and redder. At this point, his friend chips in. Why are you looking so nervous if it wasn't you? Because your friend looks very angry, and I have an anxiety disorder, plus you two men accosting a young woman on her own. At this point, there's a beep from behind me. We're holding up traffic. I pull off, ignoring a roar from him. However, as I was driving, I heard a prolonged beep from behind me and saw him following me in the mirror. He must have cut into the lane to follow me. I began to become really frightened as they followed me towards the main road. Wondering what I should do, a set of traffic lights turned red ahead of me and I slowed down, panicking. I quickly locked my car doors just in case. Next thing I knew, he was pounding on my car door, trying to open it. I didn't remember this, but I found out after that he had some sort of hammer in his hands, and he broke my car window, trying to pull me out of the car by my hair, then hitting me once when he couldn't get me out. I think he must have knocked me out because the next thing I know, a couple was checking my pulse and trying to stem the bleeding from a cut on my forehead. Apparently, the couple saw him moving out past me, nearly colliding with the traffic light. In the end, he was caught. He pleaded not guilty in court, and I had to take the stand. It was proven via CCTV footage 
that I wasn't the driver he nearly collided with. He's in jail still. All over road rage and a case of mistaken identity. Road rage man, you get exactly what you deserve. So this happened a couple of weeks ago and it still freaks me out. I have a doctor's appointment one morning. I'm chronically ill, so this is a regular occurrence for me. And I was on my way home. I had taken the exit off the highway that I needed. As I turned left, I noticed that there were flashing lights and a siren behind me. The road was only one lane for a short time, but then a left turn lane opened at the stoplight. That was the way I needed to go, so I pulled over there and stopped behind an SUV. The fire truck goes around, takes a left, so going in the same direction that I also needed to go. After they pass, we turn and start heading down that road. However, the SUV in front of me was only going 15 miles an hour for some reason. I slowed down. There's no passing lane, just a middle of the road turn lane. I couldn't go around him. We then come up on a road when they break suddenly and pull over towards that road, but blocking it as they were perpendicular to it. I thought that this was weird, but maybe it was someone who got lost and didn't know what they were doing or where they were going. As I passed them, they honked their horn at me. I'm not sure why, I wasn't being aggressive or anything. I think nothing of it beyond, that's weird, and I continue driving. They pull out immediately after I pass and start flashing their brights at me. Again, super weird, but okay. Then something happens that made me quite alert and very nervous. He starts charging my car from behind. He pulls back away, then slams on the gas and gets almost to my car, then beeps and flashes his brights, then rents and repeat. I was feeling very unsafe at this point so I tapped on my brakes. Nope, just caused him to honk more. He charged my car like four different times. A while up the road, there was a roundabout and I had to go left. Turns out he was going left too. However, the road then had two lanes instead of just one. I stayed in the left lane as our apartment complex was just a half a mile up the road. I was behind a semi truck who was going even slower, but I was fine with that, hoping the guy behind me would just pass me and go. He got over into the right lane, so I thought he would just leave me alone. But then he saw that I had my blinker on. He immediately hit the brakes, pulled behind to me, and turned his blinker on to follow me. By this time, I'm seriously scared shitless, and knew that if I pulled in, he would prevent me from leaving or blocking the entrance, and I sure as hell didn't want him to find out where I lived. So I turned my blinker off and went straight instead. A while up the road, he pulled beside my car, honking and screaming at me. I was frozen in fear, so I just stared straight ahead, not looking at him at all. After a minute that felt like an hour, he gunned it and raced ahead of me and the truck. I was able to reach a road and turn around to go home. Even after arriving home though, I was so scared that he would find out where I lived and do something to my fiance's car, which is what I was driving at the time. Luckily, that did not happen and I was safe. Ever since then, I have been hyper alert to people who are behind me, paranoid that someone is going to follow me. Yes, I logically know that the chances of that are slim, but anxiety doesn't listen to logic. So to the crazy, aggressive, road rage-stalking asshole, I hope I never see you again. The other night, I was driving in the center lane of a three-lane city street. All of a sudden, a car comes into my right blind spot and almost slams into me. I look over, and it is swerving in and out of the lane, 
braking abruptly. I honk and I look over to see if the driver is possibly distracted, and I see that the man driving is drinking something out of a brown bottle. The man then comes up to my side and is screaming at the top of his lungs. Not wanting to get involved, I then make a lane change to the leftmost lane to get away from this man. I can still hear him screaming, so I turn on my rear view camera and I see the man swerve across two lanes from the rightmost lane to get right behind me. He then starts speeding up as if he was trying to ram it into me from behind. Once I see him inches from my bumper, I decide to run the red light I'm supposed to stop at and make a right turn in front of the two lanes of traffic beside me in the hopes that at this point he will just leave me alone. I look at my rear view camera once again and I see that this man is still following me, trying to hit me from behind yet again. I panic and speed off onto a side street, but I look back and he won't let up. He is swerving in the lanes behind me and is trying to keep up. In the distance, I see a freeway on ramp, so I speed over in hopes of losing him on the freeway. The on-ramp has two lanes that merge into one. I pass up a car prior to the merge, thinking that that car will create a buffer between me and the man chasing me. When I look back into my camera, I see that the man is driving on the shoulder, on the brush, to the side of the on-ramp, in order to pass me and the other car to catch up to me. At this point, I am driving close to 100 miles per hour, scared for my life. So I slow down and dial 911. I explain the situation to the dispatcher, and she recommends that I try to get away to safety. The man then catches up to me and begins coming up to the side of me on the freeway. He repeatedly tries to swerve into me, as if to run me off the road. I slow down in hopes that he will pass me up, but he too slows down, and his wife is in the passenger seat, throwing a bottle at my car. For a second, I lose visibility as the car is covered in a brown, foamy fluid. I think to myself, surely this is the extent of his road rage, and I look over and it seems as if he is continuing on the freeway. Ready to get away, I then pull off on the next freeway exit, thinking I can just leave the situation. As I do so, the man sees me and makes a four-lane change onto the exit ramp and tries to ram me once again at the freeway exit. I am then forced to speed through the city streets, and I finally end up at a red light trapped next to the man. I look over at the man and I roll down my window. He is screaming at me. Why the fuck did you honk at me, you bitch? You are trying to make me look like a bad father in front of my kids. You want to go, bitch? You beep beep little bitch. His wife is also yelling at me as well, saying, Why would you honk at him in front of my kids? I look into the back seat, and I see two children in car seats. Since I am on speaker with the dispatcher, she hears all of this and tells me to just try and get away. At this point, I am done. I just want to get away from him, so I make a U-turn to head back on the freeway. He follows me yet again and almost hits a plastic construction lane barrier to do so. He then follows me again and is trying to hit me from behind. Once I get onto the overpass to get onto the freeway, I glance at him to the side of me and I see that he is holding something up in my direction. Suddenly, I hear a very loud bang. In that moment, the dispatcher on the phone screams, Did he shoot you? Are you okay? Thinking I have been shot, I start screaming, He's shooting at me. He, he's shooting at me. He's going to kill me. Realizing that running away isn't working, I stop and the man speeds off. Luckily, there is no broken glass and I'm not injured in any way. The dispatcher tells me to pull off to a nearby safe location, so I go to the parking lot of a nearby mall. I tell the dispatcher the make, color, and model of the car, as well as a partial license plate. 
the whole time I drive there. I am concerned that the man could be following me again. But they send an officer immediately over to file a police report. In waiting for the officer, I realize that my car's cameras are always recording, so I hit the save button. The officer comes over and I tell him my story, describing everything in detail. I also tell him that I may also have footage of the entire thing. We take a walk around the car, and for the most part, there is no damage. The officer then informs me that because I am not injured and because there is no damage to the car, there really isn't anything that can be done. I ask him if it was an assault. He says because the bottle hit my car and not me, it is not an assault. I ask him if it's reckless driving. He says that here in California, that is a misdemeanor and that requires the presence of a CHP officer to convict. I then ask him if it could be considered an attempted murder because he was trying to ram into me. But he says that this is just plain old road rage and there's not much that can be done about it. At most, the officer says that once he has a complete license plate, an officer can go out and talk to him. I ask him if the potential footage could be helpful in getting this man reprimanded in some way. And he tells me to only send me the highlights and necessary screenshots, though he doesn't think anything can be done. At the end of all this, I am extremely shaken up. I eventually go home and review the footage captured by my car. Luckily, I have the entire thing recorded. The moment he almost hits me, his wife throwing a bottle at me, his face as he is yelling at me, his license plate, and even him trying to ram me. It's all recorded. A few days later, the officer calls me and confirms the license plate I have in the video with the recording he has from the freeway on and off ramps. A week and a half has passed and there's still no update. While I understand the law is the law, it is unacceptable to me that this man could be so overtly aggressive on the road, threatening my life, the lives of his children, and the lives of everyone else on the road with no sort of punishment. I was genuinely scared for my life, and in the process, both he and I endangered the others on the road. Ultimately, this has left me feeling very disappointed with the system. An act of violence was committed, and due to technicalities, the other driver gets off. I am trying to keep my retelling as factual as possible, but this was a really terrifying experience. Even in the past few days, I still feel a bit hesitant to be an aggressive driver, overtaking people, changing lanes, etc., and am not comfortable honking. I really wish I could say this didn't get to me, but it has. One odd detail is that the man was taking pictures of my car before the bang happened. What would he possibly want that for? Has anyone else been in a situation like this? Is there truly nothing that can be done? Any recommendations for how I can at least have someone check on those kids? Like I said, I have full footage of everything. Being from a third world country, you see a lot of shit happening all over. You never think it's going to happen to you. After all, you're careful. You know better. You mind your own business and everything is going to be five by five. My mom is one of the strongest women I know. She's one of 15 siblings, which I think toughened her up and made her a woman of strong morals and a no-nonsense attitude. She is one of the oldest of her siblings, so she has that nurturing mama bear thing down. She'll take crap from no one, and when confronted with fight or flight, she'll fight every single time. Like the one time my mom was picking up my sisters from kindergarten and some asshole tried to snatch her purse. She took notice of him walking towards her with no good intentions. And she told my sisters to hold on to her skirt. And when the man made his move, she just pressed her thumbs against the man's eyes and scratched him wherever she could reach. 
She's gotten mellow later in life, but for me, she is still the epitome of love and strength. This is the story of how I almost lost my mom due to road rage. I was 10 years old at the time. It was a Sunday, and I had gone to the swimming pool with my friends. My dad was supposed to pick me up at around 5 p.m. By 7 p.m., I was fuming, angry, and decided to walk back to my house. It was probably a 20-minute walk. I got home and was pissed, and my sisters were scolding me because it was dark, and it was dangerous for a 10-year-old to be walking back on his own, and that dad had gone to pick me up like five minutes ago. I didn't care. I was pissed off. I just walked into my parents' room to give my mom a piece of my mind because I couldn't tell dad off, and I found her sobbing in distress. I asked her what was going on. She was angry at my dad. She did not want to talk to him again. My anger faded away, and curiosity striked instead. Turns out, at around 4.30 p.m., when my dad was going to go pick me up, he was coming back from his farm, and some dude cut him off, and Dad, who unfortunately had some road rage, honked his horn, pulled down the window in my mom's side, and yelled a bunch of obscenities. The dude in the other car lowered his window, pulled out a gun, and started shooting at my dad's car. Dad hit the brakes and let the other car pull further away. They stopped and got out of the car to catch their breath. And that's when my mom saw a hole in the space between the passenger front door and the passenger back door. A bullet nearly missed my mom's head, and she was hysterical. They got home, and mom broke down, and dad had to calm her down. Thus, he was pretty late for picking me up. It's probably not as scary as some of the other stuff people write about, but the thought I may have lost my mom at age 10 scared me shitless. It's been 20 years since that day, and sometimes it randomly pops into my head, and I have to talk myself off that ledge when I wonder, what if? My mom once stopped to help an overturned car on the side of the highway. We get out and call the police. I saw the man choking the girl he was with. Went to tell my mom. She waved me off. Guy came up, tried to get her off the phone, asked me if I could help. I sized him up. He was about three times my size. I'm a scrawny-ass little fuck of a teenager, so I realized the only way we're going to get out of any of this is by playing it cool and running. My mom would not let me talk to her. And if I tried to raise it to being serious or yelling or anything to get her attention, it would have gotten his too. He was clearly intoxicated. He asked if I could help move the car. I had assumed it was because telling her to get off the phone wasn't working, so he was trying to bait me over to the car to hurt me. Or he was so drunk he actually thought we could move an upside-down car up a bank. I told him that was a 10-man job, and his wife screamed at him, saying she got him punching her and crashing the car on camera, and then she sent it to her sister. He grabbed my hat and ripped it off with some hair, then grabbed my throat and threw me. I had grabbed my knife before he left, for almost no reason other than I feel like something might happen. It's always advice to not escalate, but, you know... When this fucker punched my mom and threw her down the bank after talking on the phone, I didn't give a shit what I should or shouldn't do. I was ready to kill, for real, for the only time in my life so far. Going through how to level the playing field with this little tiny knife. I told him I had a knife and I would slit his throat if he touched my mother ever again. And he focused on me. I jogged back and he came to me. And every time he looked back, I would reiterate I would kill him. My mom told me to run, and I told her to go to the car, and she did. Then I let him get distracted, and I ran around him. Almost got hit by a car that was speeding on the interstate. Then made it to the car. 
waited for her to start it before I got in, and we drove to the police station. He was apprehended a couple of hours later. Two felony charges. One for choking his wife, the second for assaulting an officer. We call the police when we see people in crashes now. I still have nightmares of what could have happened if I had decided to use that knife or if he had gotten it from me. I still put keys in between my fists whenever I'm walking at night and someone is nearby. I've never had to imagine what it would be like to cut someone's throat open and see them bleed out in assessment of how this thing could end before or since. My mother's breathing still gets way faster every time we drive by that spot. This has been a PSA. It's such a cliche story, which is why most people don't believe me, but I'll leave it up to you all to decide. My boyfriend at the time was passing me home in the dark. I lived in a really rural area, tons of farms and open fields with winding roads. You didn't pass other cars very often, especially this late at night. As we were driving, we saw this lady in white far ahead of us on a straight stretch of road. I know we both saw it because my boyfriend commented how weird it was she was out so late. I just told him that some people go walking at night, which is true and she probably lived around there. Since it was so rural, night walkers weren't an uncommon thing since the only thing you had to worry about was the wildlife. We got closer and I saw the woman was facing us. Her hair was pretty light colored too, so it was hard to really make her out in the headlights because she was so pale and the lights just reflected off of her. She wasn't moving, just facing us as we drove by and then Right as we were about to pass her, she stepped in front of the car. My boyfriend slammed on the brakes. I flew forward, nearly hitting my head on the dash. And for about five seconds, we were both silent from shock. I was sure we had just hit someone. And being only like 15 at the time, that was a hard thing to wrap my brain around. But I still got out of the car first to check on the woman. You can probably tell what happened next. We got out of the car and find a huge dent on the hood of the car, but no sign of the woman. In fact, there wasn't any sign of anything at all. There was no blood. We couldn't hear anything around us besides crickets. Everything was just as solemn as it normally was around that area. We looked around for the woman in the nearby brush and everything, but never found a thing. Like I said, there wasn't any houses close enough for her to have run to. There wasn't any place that she could really be hidden. It was like she was never there, except for the huge dent in my boyfriend's car. We drove in silence the rest of the way home. I'm not really big on ghosts or paranormal people, but this really hit me hard. I told my mom what happened, and she asked all of our neighbors if they knew something. But most of them were elderly retirees and didn't know of any younger women moving in the area. A few creepy details could be that around the next corner was the old cemetery where some early settlers were laid to rest, and some girl had died a few years back from being hit by a car when the driver fell asleep not far from that area. But you can do with that what you will. It's such a classic horror tale that no one believes me, but I know it happened because Jesus Christ, that dent cost my boyfriend a pretty penny to fix, and he was not a happy camper for the rest of the week. This last December, a group of friends and myself decided to take a trip up to northern Michigan. We wanted to visit family from southern Oklahoma. Now, the drive up there typically doesn't allow for a pass through Chicago, but we decided to take a detour and take a trip through the Windy City. We enter downtown right by Soldier Field at around 4 a.m. 
We have this wild assumption that Chicago is going to be lined up and down the streets with all-night pizza joints. We find nothing, of course. Defeated and hungry, we decided to stop by one of those 24-hour subways and grab something to eat there. Now, this wasn't your typical Subway Eat Fresh sandwich shop. In the back booths are a group of hobos cuddled up, sleeping, and a plethora of shady-looking characters. The creepiest by far was the cab driver, who was in a booth alone wearing all black, hunched over, hood over his face, just devouring his sandwich in silence. The cab driver happened to overhear us talking about wanting some Chicago-style pizza, and as he takes a break from looking creepy and absolutely devouring his sweet onion chicken teriyaki, he says, You want pizza? We quickly turn and almost in unison say, Yep. He goes back to eating, and we awkwardly stare waiting for some sort of help from this guy. So I speak up and say, uh, do you know of somewhere that's open? He stopped eating for a moment and says, Yeah. Goes back to eating. By this point, I just want pizza and to get the hell out of there. So I say, Could you give us um, the directions? He looks up again and says, Yeah, it's on the other side of Chinatown, on Archer and Staten. Excited as hell, the four of us cheer in excitement say thanks, and start to pile out the door. And as we all turn to leave, we hear the creepiest chuckle coming from the cab driver. It wasn't entirely unlike Jafar's laughter from Aladdin. Shocked and a little scared, we all turn slowly on our heels and say, Why do you laugh at that? He looks up and has this, I'm luring you into a sexual assault trap look on his face and says, You're not walking there, are you? I reply with a, uh, no. He says nothing and continues eating. All of us being a little freak the hell out, hurry to the car and drive towards our destination. We get two blocks and realize why the fuck this guy asked if we were walking. I've never been so scared to be stuck at a stoplight in my life. The 30 minutes we spent in Chicago at 4 a.m. were some of the scariest minutes of my entire life. I've been to Chicago, but Chicago ghetto at 4 a.m. is pure hell. Midgets attacking our car, crack addicts walking toward our vehicle, guys in ski masks, street races, gangs, car wrecks, the staring. We got the hell out of there and never got our pizza. I guess this isn't exactly something that happened directly to me, but something odd I witnessed. This happened during the summer of 2017. Every weekday, I would wake up early at around 5 a.m. for a morning workout, then head to my job. Generally, I could leave my house at around 5.30 because my morning drive took around 25 to 30 minutes giving me just enough time for two hours before I needed to leave, before my shift started. Most of my drive was just me putting loud music on, trying to not fall asleep, and it being a freeway before 6 a.m. Almost everyone was going at least 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. I drive most of the time on a main interstate before turning off onto a smaller highway, which I only would use for a mile or so. This highway was three lanes on each side. People also drive really fast on here, but usually no more than about 75 miles per hour or maybe a pinch more. And while you get some unsafe drivers in the morning, most people aren't swerving erratically. This highway runs north and south. An on-ramp from the main street becomes a lane. Then there are two entrances from the freeway I would take every day one from the eastbound side and one from the westbound side. I hope that makes sense, but basically I got on from the eastbound side right as three cars from the westbound side are entering. One was some sort of orange, sporty-ish car, 
and the other two were identical dark gray sedans. I don't remember exactly what make and model they were, but I do remember them being fairly uncommon models. Not a sedan you'd see a hundred times a day. One was in front of the orange car, one behind. These guys were going at least 80 miles per hour. The orange car would change lanes, and the car in front would cut him off, while the one behind would change lanes to remain behind him. They kept this up the entire time I was on the highway near them, weaving in and out of cars, not slowing down before I pulled off at my exit. This could be a complete coincidence and some asshole drivers, but I definitely got the vibe that the driver of the orange car was trying to get away from the gray ones. Maybe it was extreme road rage, or maybe something more sinister. Regardless, I'll never know. So, drivers of those gray cars, I hope I don't ever see you again. It's 6 o'clock on a Friday night, and I've just gotten off work in a bad part of town. I'm driving northbound on a two-lane street when I reach the part where a freeway off-ramp merges into my lane. I'm driving in the left-hand lane when I see a black Mazda sitting at the stop sign, waiting to merge. He starts to roll forward before I even pass him, and I'm thinking he doesn't see me because of the sun or whatever. I'm getting closer, and he's still rolling, so I give two short honks. Nothing drawn out or excessive, just two polite honks. To let him know I'm there, and that I'm not planning on spending my Friday night in a car wreck. He keeps rolling, not even slowing down, so I simply drift halfway into the lane to my right. I check my mirrors beforehand, and simply go around the front of this car. I'm... Slightly annoyed, but no big deal. Let's just get home. I get maybe less than a hundred feet down the road when I hear someone yell something like, You think you're the police or something? I look to my right. My windows were rolled down because of a heat wave. And I see him alongside me with his windows rolled down too. He's angry, Hispanic, and tatted up. He's wearing a wife beater and he shaved his head. So I'm thinking he's a gangbanger because gangs are rampant in this part of town. He continues to ask if I'm a cop and I say, I don't want an accident. I know it doesn't make sense. That's just what came out. We repeat our cop slash accident lines a few times when he does something that scares me shitless. He takes his right hand off the steering wheel and reaches towards his waist and I immediately think, Holy shit, this motherfucker's packing some heat. I don't know if he actually had a gun because I can't see his hand, and I don't really want to find out either. I start pulling back because I'm not giving him a clean shot. It's a good thing, too, because he starts drifting into my lane, but it's a slow enough drift that I'm not sure he's trying to run me off the road. Either way, I've pulled back far enough that he swerves right into my lane and misses the front of my car. He swerves right into the right-hand lane, and he starts to slow down too. Since I started decelerating earlier than he did, we're both slowing down, but I'm still putting distance between our cars. The second scared shitless moment occurs when he slows to a complete stop. I stop too because there's no way in hell I'm passing him. So he's sitting there in the right-hand lane, and I'm sitting here in the left-hand lane, about five or six car lengths behind him, and we're both just stopped in the middle of traffic. Cars are backed up behind me. There's a stopped car to my right, and there's a concrete barrier between me and oncoming traffic, so this freaks me out because I feel completely boxed in. Nobody honks. Nobody moves. We're all just waiting to see what the guy does. The adrenaline's pumping, and I run through my options. One, if he gets out of his car and I see a gun, I'm ducking behind the dashboard, flooring it, and running him down. Two, if he gets out of his car, I'm letting him get close, flooring it before he can get back into his car, 
and he'd better get out of my way or I'm running him down. Three, if he gets out of his car and just stands in the middle of the road like an idiot, I'll consider running him down, just in case. Now, I'm not a violent person by nature, and I'm still shocked that I considered running down another human being as an acceptable option, but I was under a lot of stress. So I'm sitting there in my car, waiting for him to make his move. It felt like eternity, but it was probably less than a minute before he starts moving again. He's driving well under the speed limit, and I'm thinking he wants me to pass, but I failed my first driving test for going too slow, and I can go slower than him. I'm probably driving 20 in a 45 mile per hour zone, but by the time we reach the traffic light, he goes through and I make sure I catch a red light. I pull into the next AM PM because I'm still pretty rattled and I grab a corn dog and wait for my hands to stop shaking before heading home. If we ever meet up, I better hope I'm behind the wheel because otherwise I'm out of options. This is not my story, but my father's. About 17 years ago, my dad was a bait fish hauler who had runs from Arkansas to the Northeast and Midwest. At one point, while he was in Ohio, traffic came to a dead halt. There was an accident right up ahead of him. A car had been barreling down the highway and drove right under a truck and hit the dot bar. Dad noticed the smoke figured it meant a fire was starting up. So he jumped out and ran up to the back of the truck where a bunch of other truckers and some other drivers were. An engine fire was indeed starting and there were two kids in the back seat of the car, real disoriented from the impact. The back passenger window was too small in the car for them to smash open to get the kids out. So they had to go through the front passenger window Dad was the only one with a small enough frame of the group willing to climb in, so he did. Unfortunately, the driver was too stupid and hadn't been wearing a seatbelt. He'd been decapitated and his body was laying over on the passenger seat. So my dad had to climb over him between the front seats and pull two kids who were basically dead weight out. He managed to do so car was mostly engulfed in flames about 15 minutes later. They handed the kids off to an elderly couple who took them back to their car and cleaned the blood off of them and gave them some sandwiches they had packed. State troopers got there a while later, took some statements and all that from everyone. The state boys went back and checked on the kids. They were mostly fine, just a little shook up. The oldest one was a little girl, and Dad had to chuckle at one point when the little girl said, Mama's going to be mad at Daddy this time. Made him wonder what other boneheaded moves the dude had done in the past. I remember when Dad came home after that run. He had a styrofoam ice chest with him that had his clothes in ice water. Those clothes had just been absolutely drenched in blood. Luckily, all of that came out in the wash, which was good with him because it was his favorite pair of jeans covered in blood. I lived in the Colorado Rockies for a few years and for fun would spend hours driving up and down old dirt logging roads. Sometimes the road would just be wide enough to accommodate my Volkswagen bug, and most of the time I'd have to drive 20 miles an hour or less, navigating gigantic rocks and potholes, hoping I wouldn't get stuck or fall off the steep slopes to the sides. One day, toward the end of the afternoon, it was getting a bit overcast, and I could tell a thunderstorm was approaching. So, I decided to find the main road and head back via a small town called Montezuma. If you know anything about this town and its history, it is way up there in altitude. And back in the day, basically consisted of 
100 or so recluses in a post office. Lots of odd people up there, and you didn't exactly feel welcome passing through. It was almost like people were watching you from their cabin windows. So anyway, I pull out of the logging road into a clearing, probably 50 yards in diameter, and surrounded by tall pine and aspen trees. To the other side is the forest service road that leads back down to civilization. In the middle of the clearing is an odd beat-up pickup truck with a shell on it that has a bunch of compartments along the sides. The doors to the compartments were all propped open, but nobody is around as far as I can tell. I drive a bit closer and see that there are maybe 10 dogs, like just a bit older than puppies running around the truck. They're mutts, tall and skinny as hell, and stupidly, I get out of my car to look around. The dogs come running up to me, so I bend down to pet one, and it starts off friendly enough. Soon enough, most of them are there. Some of them are playing tug-of-war with an old piece of duct tape. I couldn't tell if they were hungry or maybe abandoned, playing or what, so I yell, Hello? Hello? No answer. I yell again a minute or so later, and for whatever reason, at that moment, I get the very distinct impression that I am being watched from the perimeter of the clearing. By then, the dogs had me surrounded, and a few were nipping at my hands and legs. So I start walking back to the car, and one jumps on my hand. I'm trying to keep calm, knowing better than to run, but... By that time, I get back to my car, some of the dogs are growling, and a few more trying to jump on me. The storm is coming in now, the wind is blowing, and a light rain starts. I get into my car and have to push one of the dogs out as I slam the door. They're all at the door now, looking menacing, teeth bared. I slowly drive out of there as the thunderstorm breaks full out. Looking in the rearview mirror, I did not see anyone around. A few miles down the road, I reach Montezuma and consider stopping to report what I saw, but just decided to get the fuck out of there as fast as humanly possible. This happened just last night, and honestly... I'm still a little shaken up over it. I'll try to retell the tale exactly as it happened, but my fear is sure to have fudged my memory a bit. I work evenings as a dispatcher in a medium-sized Midwestern city. I was driving home at 2 in the morning when I stopped for gas. In retrospect, it was stupid to have stopped at all. The gas station was poorly lit and completely empty of any other customers but I knew the shady areas of town, and this was not usually one of them. As I was pumping gas, I noticed a middle-aged woman sitting on the curb across the parking lot. It was a cold night and had just started raining. The woman was not wearing anything weather-appropriate clothing-wise, so she was drenched. When the woman saw that I was watching her, she called out to me from across the parking lot. My second of many stupid decisions that night was choosing to engage with her. I was worried for her, so I approached her to see what sort of help I could offer. Hi, beautiful. I'm just trying to get home, but no one will help me, she says. I'm trying to get to City A, but the cab ride is $60, and I only have 40 can you help me? I don't usually give money to panhandlers, but this woman seemed genuine. The weather was terrible, and my job centers around helping people, so I agreed. I told her I didn't have any cash, but if she would come with me inside, I'd take some money out of the ATM and give her a few dollars. But the ATM wasn't working. I apologized and told her there was nothing else I could do for her. She followed me back outside, idly chatting with me as I opened my driver's door to get in. And then she got in my car. I was too shocked to really say anything. I sat staring at her as she buckled herself into the passenger seat. 
As soon as she got into my car, her demeanor changed entirely. She no longer seemed forlorn, as much as she did extremely excited and restless. Just take me to my aunt's house, she said. She can give me money there. Of course, alarm bells are going off in my head. Although my first instinct is to tell her to get the fuck out of my car, my gut tells me that would be dangerous. She'd already proven to be unpredictable. She seemed to be high, and I didn't know if she had any weapons on her. Forcing her out of my vehicle, I thought, had the potential to elicit a violent reaction. Where are you asking me to take you? I finally said. Just start driving and I'll tell you where to turn. No, if you want me to consider driving you anywhere, I need you to tell me where we're going, I said with no real intention of driving her anywhere. Oh, don't worry, honey. I'm not one of the bad people. I I'm not going to rob you or anything. Please just drive. No, I repeated. What is your aunt's address? Okay, it's on Street A. What's the house number? As I was asking her questions, she got really agitated. We still had not left the gas station parking lot. I considered getting out of the car and going into the gas station for help, but A. She had seemed to know and be friendly with the one attendant that was inside when I tried to get money, and B. I wasn't able to leave her alone in my car. Finally, she snapped at me and said, Why are you asking so many questions? I thought we were friends. You don't trust me? Is it because I'm black? I work at a police department, I said. It's my job to ask these sort of questions. She flipped the fuck out. She started yelling at me about being a snitch, about trying to get her in trouble, just in general losing her damn mind. At this point, I'm more scared than ever. I just wanted her gone. But my instincts still told me asking her to get out of my car wouldn't work, so I decided to take a risk. I'm not a police officer. I just work at a police department. Why don't I take you to a Walmart and see if there's an ATM that works there? My idea was to get her out of my car as peacefully as possible, then lose her in the store. She liked my idea and immediately calmed down. I knew that driving off with this woman in my car was incredibly, incredibly risky, but it seemed like my best option at the time. As we're driving, she keeps talking to me. Her thoughts were erratic, bouncing all over the place. It seemed difficult for her to follow through with one thought, but this is roughly how our conversation went. I'm glad we're friends again. I have about five or six people trying to get me. I'm going to come to your work tomorrow so we can go arrest them together. Okay, uh, we can talk about that tomorrow. Tonight you said you're trying to get home? Yes, honey, I'm trying to get to City B. City B? I thought you said you needed to go to City A. Uh, yeah, yeah, City 8, uh, that's what I meant. That, that's why the cab is only 40 bucks. It's far away. The cab ride is $40? Yeah, baby. You said you have 40 bucks. I do, baby. I have $40, but the cab ride is 60 There was silence. Are you sure you can't take me to my aunt's house? She lives close by on Street B. I thought you said she lived on Street A. <laughs> no, baby, I meant Street B. But it don't matter because she won't give me money anyway. You sure you can't just take me to City A? It was terrifyingly obvious that this woman was utterly full of shit because the details of her story were constantly changing. When we pulled up into the Walmart parking lot, she finally got out of my car only after I got out first, and followed me into the store. I told her before we went to find an ATM, I needed to use the restroom. My plan was to call the police from inside a stall, but she followed me into the bathroom, and that's when things got really weird. 
She grabbed the crook of my arm and whispered into my ear, If you don't got no money to give me, that's okay. But let me ask you something, sweetie. Do you like getting your coochie ate? I told her no as forcefully as I could imagine, bolted into a stall, and locked the door as fast as I could possibly manage. As soon as I had a barrier between us, I said, You know, I have some friends at the police department that can probably help you better than I can. I'm just going to give them a call and we can figure this thing out together. Again, at the mention of the cops, she started screaming at me. I just kept reiterating that the police would help her. She snapped at me that she was just going to leave and stormed out of the bathroom. But it wasn't over. I waited to make sure she was really gone. Sure enough, not 60 seconds later, after she left, she came back into the bathroom and started banging on the stall door. And she said something that scared me more than anything else. Hey, come back to your car with me. I left my beer in your car. I blatantly told her no. I saw her get into my car, and she had absolutely nothing with her other than the clothes on her back. After that, she left the bathroom again and didn't come back. I waited a good five minutes before exiting the bathroom. I immediately found a manager who called the police for me. Thankfully, I was in a different police jurisdiction from the one I work in because I was mortified at how entirely stupid I had been the entire night and would have died of embarrassment if any of my coworkers had responded. The officer that responded took my statement and advised me to be more careful in the future. He said that sometimes panhandlers turn violent and that just recently there had been a report of a woman who matched my description assaulting a good Samaritan that had stopped to try to help her. I definitely learned a lesson on stranger danger and I'm lucky to have come out unscathed. I'm glad my stupidity didn't kill me. So... The next time you try to help a stranger late at night, do yourself a favor and just don't. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true road trip horror stories. I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge the reform members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Mrs. Innerscare, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise Sess, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's Knees. Thank you all for your continued support. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.